this thing of Christ being slain before the foundation world. I said this in one of my videos. I've also said in my notes. You know, the reality, the eternal fact, is more real than what we saw manifested some 2,000 years ago. Now, we would say that was real. Now, if you was there, you know, you had blood would have been splattered on you, and you would have heard her, there's individuals in pain. The reality of this world was made real. So much so that would make it so it would qualify as a true experience. I mentioned this thing, others have gotten to it, scientists have questioned it, and thinking maybe we're living in a hologram, you know, like a hologram deck. It's not really reality, but it's made so real that at times you begin to realize this is real. And this question about heaven, God, you know, and eternity, it's its not real. This is real. This is tangible. I've had people say, uh, you, uh, you, your arguments aren't tangible. You talk about unseen God. And I said, well, yeah, the seen is more or less ate up the unseen. And the, the reality was created this so-called reality, which in the book of Rome is saying, God has subjected the world to futility, to unreality. He's made it so real, yet he didn't want it to overwhelm us and become what they call to the stream. I got a lot of good pieces, and I'll be coming out in my uh, series, The Ultimate Intention of God, of the extremism that evil has done. To make this so overwhelmingly real that God, you know, God feels unreal. You want him to become real in your life. We've always had that, you know. And just about the time you get some sensation that God's real, you see him work in your life. You know, every peak is preceded by a valley. <laughs> You're right back in the valley again of this overwhelming house, dogs, cats and dogs, wife, kids, jobs, you know, neighbors. The whole world seen in the news and all sorts to you know cl to cloud out the reality of that single experience and that Mount P experience you have with God. Thank God that we get those glimpses of glory. Without them, you know, without that sensation of glimpse of, of glory and the overwhelming sensation of joy at that moment. We you know Jesus, what made him uh, make it through this life? He said, Oh, for the joy that was present with him. He endured the cross, despising shame, now sits down the right hand of the Father. That joy that was present with him helped him endure this experience, even to the point of death on a cross, you know. What was that joy? In the, in the Greek text, that particular verse in the book of Hebrews is talking about a pre-existent joy that he had with the Father. And at the young age of 12, he began to realize who he was, where he came from. Here's this man, Jesus, in the mood of a human being who was the Son of God. Deity as God. You know, now, you know there are people who argue the Trinity. You throw out the Trinity, all this don't make sense. You end up with like those of the Jehovah Witness idea you know, that Jesus must have been an angel. Then they came down here to be a man. I mean, they get on the it gets all confused if you don't understand the fact of just who Jesus was. He was God manifest in flesh, the living word, and we beheld his glory. The only begotten Son of God. I like what Francis Schaeffer said in one of his books. He was talking about the deity. If you throw out the Trinity, you throw out what they call unity in diversity. How do you get unity out of all the diversities we see? Just like male, female, uh, Jew, Greek, bond, free. You know, all those divisions we got in this world today. How would you how would you get unity out of the diversity? It's a philosophical question that apart from the Trinity, it, it can never be answered. There's no unity. I like what Paul brings out in the book of Ephesians. Preserve the unity of the spirit. And the bond of peace. A peace, as he says in Philippians, that passes all understanding. This passage you have natural understanding. It says, you know, anything that we haven't been warned, eyes not seen this, nor dear heard it, 
And those that enter into the heart of man, those things which God has prepared for them that love them. You know, if you're willing to know this truth, this reality, beyond what you call length, breadth, heights, and depths of this experience we've got, it's very limited, restricted. It's like I said, it's a holograph deck. It's not real, but it's real enough to make it real qualifies a true experience. Where did God turn the lights out? <laughs> I brought a video on that. Uh, when you leave, turn the lights out. When we leave, the Christian body of true believers in Christ, leave and go to that which was prepared for us before the foundations of the world again. When we leave, the lights go out. This world abides in darkness. If it weren't for the light of the church, which Jesus said that he was the light of the world, and before he left, he said, you will be the light of the world. And you're not to hide that under a basket, you know? you know. Hide out. Be afraid. Express the truth. And this darkness of this world is like a dark cloud that's coming closer and closer and closer and the point where once the church is removed, only he who now let it, let it to be taken out of the way. When we remove darkness, hits this planet. Now, I'm talking about, you know, it, it's going to be not only if, uh, in the spiritual sense, it's also going to be in the physical sense of this darkness coming on this world. And this world, that God had made it real enough to qualify experience, becomes more unreal. And after all, as this world becomes unreal, that world will be revealed like another portion of one of the visions of that series in the old intention of God. I bring out how, uh, just suppose that the heavens, you know, the, the black backdrop of space was removed and all the objects of space were removed and here comes this bright light. You know, during the millennial reign of Christ, you know, sun, moon, the light that this world, he'll be the light of the world. And we will, as adversaries, send out from the New Jerusalem through Christ, ministering in this thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, we will go out as the lights of the world in designated areas of this world. All the cracks and crannies, you know. <laughs> you know, there's a whole piece. I want to get in that someday in another video about this. Uh, just what we're going to be doing during the millennial reign of Christ on earth. We'll be here. We'll be in resurrected bodies. You'll be as the one degree of glory to another degree of glory from faith to faith as you perceive now and grew in that wisdom knowledge of God today that glory will be manifested to your being as one star different from another so shall we in that kingdom so I'm going to ask you you want to be a little spark <laughs> you want to be a little candle or you want to be a glowing bright light and given not only one little town one little city but whole areas you know Maybe I'll be in New Jersey. Maybe uh, Mary, my friend of mine, she'll be in. Uh, she'll go to, back to where she they you know, originated from Cuba. She's Cuban. Or uh, um, Marie uh, down here in Virginia, and uh, and Sydney out there in Colorado, and George in Georgia, and then uh, Suzanne in uh, New Zealand, and uh, Danielle and Eric and Irene and I. Uh, uh, who knows where we're all going to be. We're going to be designated different areas of this world. It depends on what de degree we have picked up and learned. You know, Paul talks about the foundation been laid. I say the salvation matter shouldn't be argued anymore. Get in uh, Hebrews chapter 6. You know, he's arguing. Uh, do I have to go back to his old ground again about how to be saved? God solved that before the world ever began. Before there was a fall. Before he was born. He took the injustice of the fall of Adam and justified us as though we have never were born through Adam, giving us the opportunity to the, the day of birth and to the age of accountability, that child is covered under that pre-salvational eternal fact of God uh, doing something for us all. And he put us all our names in the book of life. Like I mentioned in my other series, you, know, you can't block something out if it ain't there. You know? It had to be there. The question is, when was our name placed there? We're placed there before the foundations of the world. Your name, my name, is in the book of life. You want it there? You want to keep it there? Well, you can, at the age of accountability, blot that name out by your own free will choice to decide you want to try that on the foot, what God's done, or by default, not get to understand it. That's the question. Everyone has the opportunity to make their free will choice 
God never violates the free will choice of man, but he also activates his will. And his will was before the foundation of the world, before this injustice occurred. He knew it would occur and solved it before the foundation of the world and justifies us. Now it's Holy Spirit's task for those that receive this justification work of Christ. It's not a matter of salvation now. Now it comes a matter of wood, hand, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. Paul said, there's no other foundation to be laid. I laid that foundation. That foundation comes through the mystery that was hid before the foundations of the world, before time began. The mystery, now understand, he's understanding this mystery. He's going back over the Old Testament. He's writing the New, so he's not quoting the New Testament. He's quoting out of the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, it talks about the salvation of work done by God and was demonstrated by an act of eternity. Of, of a physical slain of land which represented an eternal fact of the land of God slain before the foundation of the world. What they saw in symbols we saw demonstrated in time and space through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm saying. The fact of it was eternal and that eternal fact was way outweighs any demonstration be a symbol of a sacrifice of a land or the symbol of a cross that came up before the foundation of the world. Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. God solved the salvation problem. For those that want to sit there and debate how to get saved you know, and give you a list of adding to or taking away from what God has done, you don't want to do that. God solved the salvation problem. He saved us all. Now, you can reject that. So, I mean, you don't just never do nothing about it. you got to make a decision. If you don't make that decision, then you will lose your salvation. Then you gain back what Adam, what Christ covered for you was the fall of Adam. You become cursed again. Like when Cain, when he set up his own way of uh, appeasing God. He didn't go the way of his brother and what his father had taught him. He's trying to offer his own self-righteous works. The works of his own hand labors and God rejects it. And God tells him, sin's lying at the door. That's sin nature that I took away to the death of my son slain before the foundation of the world, represented by the sacrifice of a lamb. If you don't follow that way, you have reestablished again the fall of Adam. And it's not Adam's fall now, it's yours. You have reinstilled a curse on you. Your kids will have the same decision to make. But understand, it's going to be, be rough. If two parents, you one of them understand what I'm talking about here. If both them parents are what to call, don't comprehend what God accomplished before the foundation of the world. And they don't teach their kids. That kid's going to train up a child on the way to go. When he gets old, he won't depart from that way. He'll follow the lead of his parents. And that, that teaching of the parent, cut off on God. Assures that his kids will be cut off from God, that his kids will be cut off from God, that his kids will be cut off from God. That's why you got a whole generation has no knowledge and idea of God at all. It didn't have to be that way. The choice is still there at the age of accountability. You've got to make that decision. Get in my uh, series. What am I talking about? Uh, the simplest answer. That's it. And get into the one that breaking the bonds, of, breaking the chains of our bondage. That gets into this. Explains it. And I keep narrowing it down and narrowing it down. So a lot of times people can't listen to a long video. They can't read long articles. So you narrow it down and narrow it down to a paragraph. Simple statement. If you knew that your name was placed in the Lamb's Book of Life before you were born. Before the fall of Adam. Before there was ever a problem in this whole world. And God foresaw that this would be considered injustice. Why would you have to suffer the consequences of what someone did thousands of years ago before you was ever born? That'd be an injustice. God correct it to justification. He justifies it as though you were never born through Adam. You have that choice. We call it new birth. Yeah, that I don't like using that because it's got so distorted this thing of new birth. You know, even if there's a new age use this thing about we gotta be born again. They got it so distorted and a lot of good well meaning Christians quoting from the Bible. Think of it. When Jesus said, you know, not all that say, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom. There'll be those who have to profess to them that which they profess or confess or believe and say to them, I never knew you. 
What do you mean you never knew me? I went to church. I tied my money. Uh, we did many wonderful works in there. We got slayed in spirit. No, we had to. Do, we did all these things in church. And he said, "Depart from me, you who worked iniquity. I never knew you." This thing of iniquity is something really different than we may have understood. It's a horrible sounding word, and it is. He said, "Iniquity comes up from the lie." The lie that Adam fell for, and the lie that Cain fell for, and the very same lie that you could fall for. Don't believe it. There's no way of salvation. For by grace are you saved. That grace was before the world began. For by grace are you saved. God gave me something you don't deserve. What did you deserve? To go the way of Cain, to go the way of Adam, to stay under this curse. God removes the curse. He justifies you before the foundation of the to the same slain uh, of his slaying of his son, the shedding of his blood, and taking the blood of his son and pinning your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you can blot it out. If you want to blot it out? Reject this. Try to underfoot what I'm saying right here now. What the Word of God's saying. Not me. The Word of God's saying it. If you tried that down the foot, there's no more sacrifice. You can come up with an idea of Jesus and another whole different idea of gospel, of uh, church attendance, money, you know. Nothing wrong with all that stuff, but if that's your salvation based on the fact of your performance and your church attendance, your tithing, and the wonders singing, songs, everything you got. If that's your idea of salvation, you missed it. You misunderstood what, what was the, the salvation. It's not about salvation. That salvation problem was not by the will of man. Read first or John chapter 1. It's not by the will of man. It was the will of God before the foundation of the world. Between the Father, Son, and the Spirit, they determined how they would address this injustice put on all humanity through the fall of Adam. He was a son of God. He became a son of man. And everyone through him became sons and daughters of Adam. Why do you think Jesus had become a son of man? It was a son of man that created the problem. But a son of man, being corrupt, couldn't die for all the world. Why well, do you think he had to be virgin born? He couldn't have been born to Joseph. If he was born to Joseph, he would have had the sin nature of Adam. No, he's an Adam, the second Adam. Born virgin to the womb of a woman, be a true legitimate man, and never fell. Was tempted as we were, but never yielded to the temptation to act independent from God. You know, get this all moth-eaten idea of sin out of your head. You know, sin is nothing more than you acting independent from God in any way, shape, or form. Don't act independent from God. Follow what I've been trying to say. Follow what the Word of God is saying. See it for what it's really saying. It's not a salvation problem. Paul saw that. He solves the mystery, and he reveals the mystery. Here's the mystery. There's no other foundation being laid, and that which was laid. That foundation was laid before the foundation of the world, and his opinions and ideas, how to gain God's favor. Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Now you can build on that foundation. When you build on that foundation, it can be wood, hay, and stubble. Or gold, silver, and precious things. He said, be mindful of what you build here. It's not about losing your salvation. You lose. You can't imagine what you're going to lose. That big like God offers you a vast kingdom. Everything you can imagine in that kingdom. And here in this life, because of your neglect and putting one hand stubble on this foundation, you don't gain every little piece, piece by piece. And as it says, one star is going to differ from the other. You know, how much of that kingdom do you want? Paul wanted to know him the power of his resurrection. He wanted it all. Length, breadth, height, and depth of God's love. And a kingdom is offered before John. This How much of that kingdom do you want? Salvation's already been solved. Focus on the works. Not to gain salvation. It's out of what God's done. And he's offering. Take the offer. God bless you.